Would you say the church treats women as inferior? Sometimes. Or that women feel they're treated as inferior? Yeah. Sometimes. Would you say the Bible is pro-woman, is not pro-women? Do men don't realize they are prejudiced against women? Okay, so now all these are emotional topics, and if you actually start discussing them with people, it's going to become more emotional probably, especially if whoever you're talking this over with is, doesn't have the same outlook that you do. And so, you know, I recognize that, and, you know, our emotions can work for us as Christians, but they can also work against us. And so the trick is to uh, understand them, and, you know, certainly our, our emotions can lead us in the right direction in some cases, you know, a way in another. Okay, so I'd like to start with the Bible. So, how prominent are women in the Gospels? Here's a question. Now, when I think about the, the Gospels, I think especially about pairs, and especially in the opening chapters of the Gospels, it's men and women that are paired together. Okay, now think about the beginning of the Gospels, and really who is in leadership and who's doing what. So it starts out in Luke 1 with Elizabeth and Zechariah. Now, what's interesting about the story? Uh, who is the dog in the story, Elizabeth or Zachariah? <laughs> Zachariah is the bad guy, right? I mean, he faces an angel and says no, right? Okay, so he's the dog in the story, and it's Elizabeth who steps up and is the hero. And so really the, pers the first New Testament prophecy we have is from a woman who is Elizabeth. Because when Mary comes, what does she say to Mary? The mother of my Lord. Okay, so she is prophesying who Jesus is. He is Lord. I mean, I don't mean prophecy in the sense of prediction, but prophecy in the sense of uh, speaking God's word, right? So she is identifying this baby in this womb as being her Lord, right? So it's a testimony and a prophecy together. It's really quite striking when you think about that. And of course, we read that story probably every Christmas, right? And that almost flies over your head. She is the prophet He's the dog. Now, of course, it does flip at the end of the story uh, when John is finally born, then Zechariah his, has his prophecy too. And by the way, you remember the way they are uh, introduced. They're both from the priestly lines, which in their honor culture is important. You know, both of them have high status as a result. He didn't marry down, you might say, or she didn't marry down. And so they start out equal, and they both end up uh, being presented as prophets, which is quite striking. Okay, so who's the last to know, Mary or Joseph? Uh, Joseph is, right? Um, and God certainly does talk to both of them. In, in a sense, they kind of trade leadership uh, positions, or both lead in a certain way. And then they bring Jesus to the temple, and there's another pair, Anna and Simeon, right? And so both of them function as prophets. Both of them recognize that this is the Savior. And uh, his prophecy is more emphasized, although she is called a prophet there. Her, prophet isn't, her prophecy isn't like recorded, right? But she is called a prophet. He does give a prophecy, although he's not called a prophet. And then uh, she becomes a witness, right? talks about her going and speaking to people there about this. So that's pretty striking. These are all these are all paired up, you know, that those you know why, why is that anyway? You got Anna and Simeon, Mary and Joseph of course obviously, right? Um, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Okay, so I like to think about other uh, things that are introduced. So at the beginning you have the 12 apostles. Okay, what so what's odd about six of the 12 apostles? I think this is odd, but uh, what do you think is odd about them? They're almost never mentioned. They're almost never mentioned. Mm -hmm. Some of the apostles, about about a half dozen of them, are named, but what uh, there's never anything quoted by them, or maybe just one sentence, uh, and there's nothing particular they do. They're spoken of in groups. You know, like all of them go out and preach or all of them go out and heal, whatever. But it is striking that, you know, these guys, what do you know about Bartholomew, Thaddeus, James, the son of Alcephus, Simon the Zealot, and James, the Lord's brother? 
just about nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, so just pretty much they're mainly unknown. Now, other women are named, by the way. There's uh, Joanna, Susanna, Salome, who are traveling with Jesus. And then there's five different Marys. Boy, talking about a popular name. Uh, Mary who? Uh, Mary, the wife of Cleopas. And Mary who? The mother of Jesus. And Mary who? Magdalene. She's from Magdala. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's interesting that they are named. They're not just mentioned as a group. A bunch of women went with them. And they're singled out. And those are some of the Bible verses. Okay, so what did they do? These women who they supported their ministry somehow. Mm -hmm. well, they were very obedient. I mean, much of the time they believed them. When, I mean, they, they just had kind of that blind faith, maybe more. They were the first ones of the two. Yeah. They're not singled out as being prideful the way the men are. <laughs> so that's probably a good thing. <laughs> okay, so here's the verse that we think about the most Luke 8. The twelve were with Jesus and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities who provided for them out of their means. Now it doesn't say too much more, although it, there is something a little later. But what you do see in the Gospels is that Jesus is like busy, right? I mean, he feeds 5,000 people because there's 5,000 people who all want to see him, right? Okay, so if you're you know, at the back of the crowd or even in the middle of the crowd or even at the front of the crowd, you don't talk to Jesus. So who do you talk to? His entourage, that's who you talk to. You talk to the, the, the people who seem to be close to him. So at least if you can't ask Jesus, you can ask someone who spends a lot of time with him. And who are the women probably mostly asking? Women. Probably mostly asking other women. Uh, there is, I think, more or less interaction between the sexes in their culture than in ours. Um, but also you just approach people who are most like you, right? I mean, if you're a 50-year-old you know, woman, you're more likely to approach a 50-year-old woman than a 20-year-old man, and vice versa. You know, the 20-year-old man is more likely to approach another 20-year-old man. So, so people look for like-minded people. And so I'm sure they had a constant uh, barrage of people in those public situations who are approaching them. So I can picture the apostles for sure spending a lot of time talking to men who have questions and these women talking to a lot of women who have questions. A lot of that's going on that's not pictured. No. So why isn't that pictured in the Gospels or described? Well, what's the point of the Gospels? Jesus is the Messiah. And that's the point, right? That's the goal. That's what everything in the Gospels is oriented around. It's not oriented around telling you everything that uh, his followers did. You just get a smattering of that. Okay, the point is, Jesus is the Messiah. That's what we need to know. And so there's a whole lot of other details that are not mentioned because it doesn't contribute to that point. It's not meant to be a history. It's meant to be to tell us he's the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. Okay, now you're, uh, you're acquainted with the story, of course, of Mary and Martha. You know, Mary is listening to Jesus, Martha is serving. Okay, so what's missing from this story? It's easy to tell what's there, and we, we teach and preach about this all the time. What's missing from the story of Mary and Martha? The brother of Lazarus. Lazarus is missing. Now, it looks like, you know, these three are living in the same home, it appears. Um, and Lazarus is not mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, or Luke. You can read all three of those Gospels and not even know that Lazarus exists. But you do know that, do know that Mary and Martha exists. So it's, it's kind of interesting. And then, of course, the, it's the woman. It's not a man who's singled out as the person who's listening in. Uh, some, it's something we take for granted, but it really is outstanding. Okay, so we are introduced to Lazarus when he's raised from the dead, right? What does Lazarus do in that story? He walks out. He dies. Oh, he dies. <laughs> he, dies. <laughs> he, dies. <laughs> he dies first, yeah. And then, uh, well, of course, yeah, Jesus raises him. He walks out, right? Okay. Of course, Jesus had more to do with his walking out than he did. But he does walk out. Okay, what does, Jesus, what does Lazarus say? Nothing. nothing. He says nothing. Okay, well, what does Martha say? Leading up to his resurrection, 
Jesus says, he who believes and lives will never die. He who dies and believes in me will live. Uh, Martha, do you believe this? She says, yes, I believe you're the son of God. Right, so she is making a confident statement of faith that is unusual at that time because most of the people in that day don't know what Jesus is. I mean, they think, oh, he's a prophet or, oh, he's a, you know, a great teacher or he's a rabbi, blah, blah, right? And so she is saying the same thing that Peter did when Jesus challenges Peter and then he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. On this rock, I'll build my church, right? And then Jesus says, your father has revealed this to you. You don't know this on your own. So uh, basically, this is something that the Lord revealed to her. She's standing out as this outstanding witness. Okay, now the very next story after the resurrection of Lazarus is what? This is important. Not quite yet. Okay, now the problem is that the very next story is the next chapter. So we tend to like read the end of chapter 11 and then not start chapter 12. But it's really a continuous thought because of course, as you know, the Gospels weren't divided up into chapters when they were written. Okay, so what's the next story? It's Mary uh, anointing the feet of Jesus. Jesus says, She's preparing my body for burial. She, she is acting as a prophet in this case. And we treat this story as though Mary is making a prophecy of his death and his resurrection. Now, in the Old Testament, you remember that the prophecies usually come in words, but sometimes they're in actions. You know, Ezekiel is supposed to dig a hole in the wall and then crawl out of there, indicating that, you know, the Jews are crawling out of the city because it's going to be besieged. You know, he makes a little model of the city, you know, to be destroyed. Okay, so some prophecies are acted out rather than spoken. So this is one of those. So she's a prophet, and her sister is a confident like the first of uh, the, the women or the men to really profess him as the Son of God. It's really striking that Mary and Martha are definitely front and center, and Lazarus is unknown. Now, if you or I were back at the la resurrection of Lazarus, what would we do? Who would we talk to? What's it like to be dead, Lazarus? You know, tell me about this. I want to know. I, I'm going to die someday. I don't want to know what it's like, right? That's who we would talk to. Maybe you don't talk to him. Because okay, what's the focus of the Gospels? Jesus is the Messiah, or the Son of God, and so Martha says that, Mary says that. Lazarus could have said that too, and he did, right? Uh, because the Gospel does say later that the Jews wanted to kill Lazarus because people were coming to the Lord through him. So he was speaking up too, but that's not who, who Luke is focusing on. He's focusing on the two women. And as you know, it's the women who show up at the crucifixion, not the men, except for maybe uh, John shows up. Uh, and then you know the story of the resurrection, too. Okay, so women are leading the way in these stories. Now, what if an Orthodox Jew or a Muslim wrote those stories of Lazarus' resurrection and of Jesus visiting Lazarus' house? How would it look? Yeah, Lazarus would be listening to Jesus, right? And Mary and Martha would be where they're supposed to be in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's how it would read. And at the resurrection of Lazarus, you know, they would probably be uh, afraid and wondering what's going on. Uh, and Lazarus would be the featured person, but he isn't. It's pretty striking. So as you know, you know, Orthodox Jews, there's a separation between men and women that's quite strong. Um, men study the Torah, women don't. Uh, now, in, in the first century, I believe women were taught to read in the synagogue. Girls were taught to read in the synagogue. Uh, so they had, as far as I know, basic you know, reading ability, but they weren't expected to read publicly in the synagogue. And uh, so men were to do that. Uh, nowadays, the men attend yeshiva. Maybe you've seen this picture before. This is the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem. There's this fence, right? The women are on one side, the men are on the other side. You know, there's a strict separation there. And the same in uh, mosques. So, yeah, if the Muslims are 
uh, Hasidic Jews would have written the story, it would have looked a lot different than what we see in this. So the hero would have been Lazarus, it would have been Zechariah, not Elizabeth. Zechariah would be doing all the prophesying. You know, Matthew would be getting all the information uh, and Lazarus. So, yeah, it's pretty, pretty striking in that way. And especially the unmarried woman, I think, would especially not be featured at all. Since in those cultures, you know, the, the marriage and the children is, is emphasized so much. So think about pioneers and evangelists in the Gospels. The first one to, person to prompt Jesus to a miracle is mom. Okay, but she is a woman, right? Uh, the first to support, among the first to support Jesus' ministry is the women, as we mentioned before. The first Samaritan evangelist is the woman at the well. She's the one who recruits her whole city, right, and brings, him, or brings her, them to see Jesus. Uh, Martha is the first to process, profess Jesus as the Son of God, at least among the first, kind of equivalent with Peter, basically. And she is kind of a counterpart of Peter, really, Mary Magdalene is. Uh, first witnesses of the resurrection are women. We talk about that quite a bit, actually. Uh, first to speak with the resurrected Lord is Mary. That's kind of striking, too. You know, why isn't it that Peter and John show up at the tomb and then they talk, they're the first to talk to Jesus. Uh, they aren't. Uh, you know, they, the woman could have been the ones to at least see the empty tomb, run back, tell Peter and John, they go back and then they talk to Jesus. But that doesn't how it worked. Mary's the first one. Interesting. In the book of Acts, it's women as well as men who are persecuted and imprisoned uh, for their faith and who scattered and preach you know that's because because the women were a threat too uh, if the women were just you know sitting at home and making the potluck they wouldn't be a threat and they wouldn't be put in in prison so they're active uh, visible in ministry there <coughs> also book of acts who does the spirit empower for ministry this is Pentecost spirit comes upon them and said you know, where your sons and daughters will prophesy, verse 17. God's male and female servants will prophesy, that's verse 18. You know, that's t doubled up, right? It says it twice in a row. Uh, prophesying is a gift in the forefront. You know, that's what that is. It's a speaking gift. It's uh, directing people to the Lord. So it's important. Uh, later on in in the uh, book of Acts as well as Corinthians. You know, women are singled out as prophets, uh, either kind of particularly singled out, like Philip's four daughters, or just spoken of in general, because Corinthians does mention uh, women who are prophets. And prophets is, you know, speaking with authority from the Lord. Uh, Anna, as I mentioned earlier, in the birth story of Jesus, is mentioned as a prophet in particular. And then there are those prophetic messages that I mentioned before. Elizabeth isn't called a prophecy, a prophet, but she is giving a prophecy. So that's what she amounts to. Um, and then these other ones as well. Uh, when it speaks about prophesying, uh, 1 Corinthians 11 mentions every woman praying or prophesying should have her head covered. So we get distracted sometimes with the head covering, like, oh boy, you know, what are they talking about? Should we have our heads covered? We should bring back hats for women in church, right? Okay, but what it says is the women are praying and prophesying in, you know, out loud in church, right? That's what it says. So, uh, you know, if you look at the core of it, the core really isn't the head covering. The core is that they're praying and prophesying in the worship services. And then Corinthians mentions that all can prophesy, all can have their teaching, their instruction, whatever, it being orderly, you know. So in the context, it looks like women are taking part in that as well. Okay, then there's my favorite, the phone book of the saints. In Romans chapter 16, it's Paul singles out 13 women and 15 men, almost split down the middle there. It's kind of interesting. If one would have flipped, then you have an equal number. Uh, seven women are described in these ways. Thirteen are named, but I mean seven are described as being a servant. You should help her because of her ministry. 
the church gives thanks for her. She's a fellow worker. She risked her life. She worked hard. She's in prison. She was sent. She's outstanding. You know, which uh, is really pointing to a um, uh, an active spiritual ministry. You know, uh, not just like a support kind of ministry. Uh, so they're uh, striking in that way, some kind of leadership in, in ministry. And the most famous couple there is Priscilla and Aquila, who are mentioned together. And uh, there's a church in their house. Uh, they instruct Apollos, you know, who has this Jewish background, but not much of a Christian background. So she's um, the most, uh, the woman with the highest profile Partly because I think she just worked with Paul so often along with Aquila. It's just partly happenstance, you know, because she was close to Paul, she's mentioned more often along with Aquila. You know, so overall, when I began to think about this, you know, there is a lot more prominence in women in ministry in the New Testament than I really, you know, thought about on the surface. When you think especially about how it could have been written instead, it, and then it becomes even more striking. Okay, so any questions or comments at this point? We're kind of transitioning in the program to a little different theme. So any questions, comments at this point? Yeah? Would you, I mean, I guess I could probably figure out the answer, but would you say that it's a lot more striking, the prominence in the New Testament versus the Old Testament? I mean, we do see a lot of figures of women in the Old Testament, but do you think it's a different, like, I think there. I, I think women are more prominent in ministry in the New Testament, and they're mentioned more, also. So you know, and there are some women in the Old Testament who stand out. You know, most. Uh, who am I thinking of? Deborah. Deborah. Yeah, she stands out the most of all. There is Hannah, who's a prophet in the what at the time of Isaiah, but you're, you really have to work hard to find them, right? Yeah. And I think basically the reason for it in the New Testament basically boils down to at Pentecost the Spirit comes on everyone who's a believer, and that's really emphasized. That was the quote from Joel in Acts two, right? On uh, your sons and your daughters, uh, you know everybody. On uh, your male and female servants too, you know that's kind of the point. So I think it is a, a product of the Spirit really coming on everyone. So why didn't the Spirit come on some more individual women in the Old Testament? Did the Spirit come on fewer women in the Old Testament, or are they just not mentioned? It seems like fewer in both cases. Yeah, why? I don't know. Well, that and Jesus. Oh, add that to the list of things I don't know about the Bible. <laughs> so for me, that's a long list. And I think Jesus, you know, starts off ministry with the Beatitudes and turns life on its head. And says, "I've come for a new order, a new structure." So um, that that concept of blessed are those who mourn and blessed are the, when you're persecuted. Um, he's he's setting a stage for life under me is going to be different. The new wine and the old wineskins who won't mix. Yeah, Jesus is definitely setting up something new. Yeah. No. Fulfillment of the old, but still quite new in many ways. And restoring something that was broken and old. Yep. Yeah, and restoring. Because mm -hmm. uh, the Jews had definitely gone hill after the time of, uh, well, after the time of Adam and Eve. They pretty much went down <laughs> hill after that. Well, for the restoration of Adam and Eve, <laughs> male and female, he created them in, in his image, right? So if there's a restoration to the impact of sin, which we see does impact gender as well. But God's restoring that. He's making, he's a God of restoration. Yeah, Jesus certainly is restoring and renewing. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anything else at this point? Okay, so that's kind of a women's ministry in the New Testament in general. I want to look more particularly about the, the issues that come up as far as women's ministry in the church settings. Okay, so definitely, you know, one of the debates is uh, if, how much you limit women's ministry in the church. We're thinking especially about the congregational setting because that's pretty much where we all list, where we all live. 
so um, like to especially look at some of the verses that are most often highlighted that talk about uh, women being subordinate in some way. So these are some critical issues to address. Okay, so here's a verse that stands out, gets a lot of heat and discussion. This is from Peter. It says to men, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the women as the weaker vessel so that your prayers may not be hindered. Okay, I just want to make a side note before we talk about this in particular since it comes up in my mind. Okay, if you read the New Testament, uh, of course, most of them are epistles, right? And they're always addressed to the saints at wherever, Ephesus, right? Which means male and female. If you read the Quran, it's addressed to men. So the Quran doesn't have like books of the Bible. I mean, it's, it's more, the Quran is kind of like more like the book of Psalms in structure. You know, the book of Psalms is like, uh, 150 psalms that are unrelated, right? So that's the way the Quran is set up. It's just like a, a bunch of independent revelations that aren't related. Anyway, it's pretty obvious when you read them, they're directed to men. That's quite different from what you see in the epistles, which are directed to everyone in all the believers in the congregation. Okay, anyway, back to where we started from. Okay, so of course the, the, the phrase weaker vessel is, is striking. So is this, uh, does weaker vessel mean in some way inferior or lacking or less capable? If not, well then what does it mean? I've never taken it to mean that because if done, if done properly, right, you're kind of given the most responsibility throughout the Bible, which I wouldn't want to be a guy who's a faithful guy. Like, you're given a lot of Ephesians, like you're given a lot, it's not just submit women. <laughs> I mean, treat her like the church. Like, that's huge, right? And I always look at that as, I see the showing honor to the woman. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't, I don't take that as a bad way of, like, I'm weaker because he's showing me honor if he's doing it right, you know? And I don't see either one of us having to be weaker in, that, in a negative sense, you know? Like, I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't take that to be a negative towards me. And if you're looking at the verb, it's the honor that's the focus, right? Right. Yeah. And, yeah. Which means don't mistreat the woman you live with. Absolutely. Yeah. Or, given a lot of responsibility mm -hmm. to do that. And treating that. the woman as a weaker vessel in that culture was perceived as a weaker vessel. So when a man treated a woman with honor, mm -hmm. it caught everybody's attention. Mm -hmm. So culturally, a weaker vessel, um, women were perceived as more of servants than partners in ministry. But you seem to be inferring that the culture is seeing her as a weaker vessel, not Peter. Correct. Because right. Peter is saying he, she's a weaker. He's not saying the culture thinks she is. Uh, I, so you kind of have to own up to the fact that he is calling her that, not just saying the culture is calling her that. Yeah, but I think he's representing, I, this is how I've been pondering this passage, he's, he understands the rest of the world is saying she's a weaker vessel. Right? But uh, you show her honor, um, it, and when you do that, the rest of the world will notice. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but he is not saying the culture thinks she's a weaker vessel, but I don't. He's not saying that. You can't, get, you can't really fairly find that in there. So, uh, exegetically, if I can be blunt, I think that's not accurate exegesis. It's excellent to be blunt. No, that's, what, that's why we have these conversations. Um, but as I look at the, the cultural milieu, there are times when we, you know, when we talk about handicapped people, they are seen as second-class citizens. The way, we, the way we treat, we would say, world, you see this as a second-class citizen. We see a redeemed child of God, a person who has the full value and worth. Okay, now, since you bring up culture, we'll bring that up later. Because this is a, a primary issue in, in dealing with these verses is, is, is some of the verses um, that somehow talk about women's submission, is that a product of culture and God isn't saying that? If that's the case, then like you're kind of throwing out anything in the Bible that has that kind of a theme and saying we shouldn't believe that because, they, because the writer, Peter or Paul, is expressing his culture, not expressing God's will. This is a real important distinction. 
Okay, we'll save that thought because we'll bring it up more. So right now I want to look at the weaker vessel, which is, uh, I see it as he's talking about vulnerability. Uh, someone who is vulnerable, you can treat with less honor, that is, treat more harshly uh, because they're smaller, right? So, I mean, probably since I was 15, you know, I've been six inches taller and 50 pounds heavier than my sister or my mother, right? I mean, that gives me an edge so far as the physical nature goes. You know, so if you are in a, you know, a man-woman situation, you know, and your husband is by nature probably more aggressive, I mean, I think that's part of our, I don't think that's just sinful. Yeah, sometimes it's sinful. But I think God has made males to be more aggressive for a purpose. That's part of our mission as a, as a man, to be more aggressive. Now, that can be misused, but there's a positive side of that. So, you know, uh, I want my girls, I want my wife to think, I'll fight for them, you know. I, I want them to think that. I don't want them to think that they're gonna, I'm going to cower in a corner if they're threatened. So there's a, an aspect of... Uh, maleness that's aggressive and should be. Anyway, so I think this is what it's after, is your, your women are more vulnerable in size and especially, you know, if you're pregnant and you have small children, I mean, women are more vulnerable than men in that way. Uh, and then in, it's just, if you want to expand that, you know, outside the immediate into society, that's also true. So I think it's talking about vulnerable. So you'd be, you'd be more gentle or kind with someone who's more vulnerable, and that would extend to, to children as well. And we see that as adults, right? You know, our children are more vulnerable, so we look after them. But now that particular word, weaker, it is says in Greek, does say Jesus was crucified because of uh, weakness. Um, now that's... Uh, really, the weakness of the human body is what he's talking about, right? Um, and it does speak of the weakness of God being stronger than men. So those come up there. Yeah? Um, just a question. In, in, in verse 7, where it says, you know, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, but then there's that section that says, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Which, to me, says that you're equal. Uh huh. So is Peter really saying that women are a weaker vessel? But then in the next statement, he's saying we are heirs of grace. You can be both. I mean, my, my children are vulnerable or weak, but they're still equal to me in being heirs of God's grace, having the fullness of God's blessing. They don't get less blessing because they're children. That was kind of an issue that came up when families brought children to Jesus, right? Yeah, so you can have vulnerability and the opposite of, you know, less vulnerable and still be equal in errors. Okay, uh, I like to look at some of these verses and then uh, you can bring up more thoughts about this because I think we, uh, some of these other issues are going to come up with the other verses. Okay, so if uh, God is called he, does that mean that God is masculine? That men are made in the image of God but not women? Now, in Genesis, it does say he made the male and female in the image of God, you know. So I take that to mean humanity is made in God's image. Because, you know, I, I think we all agree God is not male or female. I mean, male or femaleness is creatures, right? Uh, God made male and female and animals as well as, right, it's part of our physical bodies. Okay, so God is a spirit. He doesn't have a body, All right? So he isn't male or female. It's not like God is a man and then he has a consort or a, a woman God, you know, because they need both. Now that is, by the way, a theme in the false gods of the Old Testament. You know, you've heard of Baal, obviously, right? Baal, Asherah, yeah, I mean, are basically, you know, uh, getting on together, right? So uh, they saw their gods as being male and female and and the Old Testament is explicit about saying it's not that way with the Lord. He is not. 
like the fertility goddess or the the male gods. So this is, you know, art. This is uh, a painting, you know, of God the Father, and I just don't like this. Uh, it it sh it pictures God as being, you know, a man and also old. You know, like I don't. God isn't old. <laughs> you know, he's not. Oh, I feel stiff this morning when God gets up. You know, this isn't a problem with him. Uh, so our art. And I can see why in, you know, long ago there's this issue. Should you have uh, not just icons, but you sh should you have paintings in the church? And this was one of the problems because people will end up thinking that God is an old man. And Muslims do, by the way, think that we think God is an old man and that Mary, you know, God and Mary had some sex together and that's how, you know, Jesus came to be. Well, Mormons think that too, uh, but we don't. So... No, and so this is where it is. So, so why do we call God He, or why does the New Testament Old Testament call God He? General term for mankind. Because linguistically, you're either a He or a She or an It. <laughs> we don't have a pronoun for a human being that could be either male or female. Now, our plurals are that way, by the way. I mean, uh, like men can be a plural that can mean humans or uh, human is, okay? But we don't have a, a pronoun that does that. Some languages, by the d way, do have a non-gender pronoun where they can say the equivalent of he or she, but it's uh, not defined whether it's a male or a female. In Greek and English and Hebrew, that doesn't exist. So, so in Greek, Hebrew, English, either you call God he or you call him she or you call him it. Okay, so if you call God it, it infers like he's like a chair or a rock, you know, not personal, not having a mind. And so you're down to either he or she. Then what are you going to do, toss a coin? Uh, you know, so some people who are especially, you know, anti-male think, you know, we should call God a female, a she. You know, that, that just changes the problem, but it doesn't fix the problem, right? Uh, it's no more accurate to call God she than it is to call him he. But this is something you do have to teach because, you know, at least on the surface, especially probably with children or people new to the faith, is they'll miss that. Now, much is made of the temptation of Eve, and that's significant, but... In the New Testament, it, it uh, really sees mankind as the problem. And, uh, you know, here in Corinthians, you know, by a human, doesn't say by a male or by a female, by a human death came, by Adam all die. Death came through Adam's transgression. Adam sinned, the woman was deceived. I mean, the... The point is, uh, both Adam and Eve are involved in this. That's really the point. Humanity is involved in the fall, um, not just women per se. Oh, here's a nasty verse. First Timothy 2, I don't permit a woman to have authority to be, be silent. Okay, so how silent should a woman be? Mm. You're asking a group of women. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting how many men grab onto this and then ignore everything else you just talked about. And so they kind of do contradict in that sense. Like it's a hard, if you're a guy who really focuses on that, it's hard to get them to get the other stuff. You know? Yep. It is, I mean, it is a kind of a shocking verse. Like, you have to do something with it, right? Now, what is, what I have noticed is even in churches where women are quite restricted uh, in, like, teaching positions in particular, they don't carry this to the extent of saying, you can't ask a question in Bible class, which is what's, if you take silent in the strict sense, I mean, silent means don't say anything, right? So they don't even take that way. Okay. So you mentioned what else is around this. Now this is interesting. If you look at this whole section, now this is just half of a verse in 1 Timothy 2, 8 to 15. 
Okay, so do you know any conservative churches which require men to lift hands while praying, that forbid women from wearing braids or gold jewelry, that forbid women from commenting or asking questions in church? Any churches that which women should be completely silent or believe that women will be saved by childbearing or that only women who give birth will be saved. See, those things are all in the rest of that paragraph. All right, so, uh, you know, I, I feel a tension in this because, I mean, uh, I don't want to say this is entirely cultural, it's throughout this whole thing. You know, because I don't think that's honest uh, as far as really treating <coughs> Scripture as God's Word. Um, and yet there's things in here that sound pretty cultural, you know, like it's speaking to something in particular. Um, and so what we, what we would do with this probably is take it in the context of the rest of the New Testament. That's really how we end up reading it. So people end up having a big continuum of how you want to interpret this, all right, but kind of like everybody has a little, you know, push and pull, a little slide as far as this goes. Um, now, I'm sure there are some Amish or something that really don't wear jewelry, right? Uh, but, I mean, how many of you are wearing gold jewelry today? Like, probably most of you, you know, a ring or a necklace or something, you know, so obviously you're I don't think your pastor said, you know, take off that necklace because you're wearing gold. Okay, or, you know, take down those braids, right? So there's a certain amount of that, okay? But, but I'm, I really feel a tension here, like, I, I don't want to throw this out and say, you know, there's no value in this. This is entirely first century, you know, God didn't intend to say any of this. I think that's uh, it's not true to the word. So at any rate, my point is that everybody, whether you're on, like, the conservative end or the liberal end, everyone considers this like a tough thing to look at, like uh, what exactly, what does this mean for me, All right? Um, and so kind of what we kind of come with is kind of we, we see the gold jewelry as being more of an ostentatious wealth thing rather than, you know, no. And in our culture, gold jewelry is cheap, right? I mean, you can get something that's, you know, uh, 10 carats sprayed on gold, you know, for 10 bucks, right? So for us, jewelry is actually cheap. I mean, it's not a display of wealth at all, really. So, so anyway, so all of us kind of have some fudge on this. So I think we should also be kind to each other in how we look at this verse, because all of us fudge a little bit one way or the other with this. Well, and it's very restrictive, I'm sorry, in that, like, where it says childbirth, like, I've, I've not had a child for, for many reasons, and it's part of the medical, and I know, like, in ministry overseas, if you're talking to women who have, I mean, what's our hope then? Like, what's the point of me sitting here today? I mean, if, if that's, like, if, you're, if they take that so strictly, then what's the hope or grace of, or the point of being a Christian? There is none. Which is why no one takes that literally. Yeah. But I mean, mm -hmm. that would close the door. And if that's how you teach it, then what's the point to any of us who haven't given birth? You know, there is no hope there. And everybody recognizes that. So in that context, I mean, I, uh, the word silent sometimes does mean silent, this Greek word. And it sometimes does mean that. Um, in these verses, you know, all Christians are supposed to lead a quiet life. That doesn't mean never talking, right? Mm -hmm. It talks more about a demeanor of, uh, of uh, a non-aggressive demeanor, I guess you'd say, or not uh, brash, I think is what it's saying when it mm -hmm. talks about a quiet life. Um, Timothy also mentions being quiet in worship, and so I think it's talking more particularly about uh, being unruly or disruptive mm -hmm. rather than having nothing to say. We could probably spend a lot more time on this verse, but I'd rather not. Let's go ahead. Greek word is used for quiet. Is it aphinos or theophanes? I don't remember. Do I say? I guess. It, oh, here it is. Oh, that's for unruly. Oh, yeah. No, I think that's the the word for silent. Yeah, it's kind of out of place. But I think this is this, not this is this. Okay.
Um, now, the that verse, you know, women should be silent and uh, what is it? There we go here. Not to have authority, you know. So, in this context, you can see that the issue of authority is probably the primary issue rather than not speaking or not having any teaching role in the church. So that's how I'd also see silent as, and, and authority being paired, not silent as opposed to teaching in any way. So let me go on with that thought. Okay, so uh, that seems to be uh, two things. One is, you know, not having worship be disruptive. And in Corinthians, certainly Paul talks about order in worship. And then the other is on uh, authority being a key part of that. Okay, so when we have uh, especially those verses that talk about limiting women in some way, you know, there are different solutions. People come up with that. One is to build an extra high fence. So that's what the Jews did. And what our more conservative churches do. You know, well, we got to make sure we follow this, you know. And so women can only teach a child until their confirmation age, right? Okay, so that becomes the, the benchmark, all right? So, so one of it is to build the higher fence. The Jews had their oral law, which is building a higher fence. But then the other is to kind of knock down the fence and say, you know, all of First Timothy about being silent, we throw that out because it's nothing but cultural, and so the door's open to, like, just the opposite, you know, any kind of authority, any kind of leadership at all. So those are kind of easy because they're simple, and they're simple to enforce. So in the middle is where things get sticky, and that's kind of where we're, pretty much we all live in the middle, right? Like, uh, how do we... Uh, I would say, how do we be faithful to Scripture, but also uh, faithful in the you know the broad sense of Scripture, and uh, f faithful in heart, you know, as well as in behavior, and really taking this as God's word and and using it in that way. So that's where it gets a little more tricky. Now, I think one problem with the verses like the weaker vessel or like being silent in church is that women are discouraged from ministry, but I'd say that men are discouraged from ministry too in a lot of our churches. Because in the, not just the Lutheran church, but most Christian churches, you know, we are kind of clergy-centric. Um, unfortunately, I think our seminaries are producing highly clergy-centric people, men, uh, these days, and that's overly restricting women as a result. Um, but that the clergy centricness isn't unique to Lutherans. It's probably stronger in some of the traditional churches, you know, like Episcopalian and Catholic. But certainly you can find Baptists and Pentecostals that are quite clergy centric too. So uh, that's a, a bad outcome, you know, that clergy, including female clergy, you know, can restrict. Uh, the ministry of both men and women. Women more than men, but men too uh, feel quite restricted by certain clergy. So there's a range of church practice when it comes to women's ministry. So, you know, on the far left here, you've got the very restrictive. Uh, women can't even vote, as someone mentioned, in some congregations. So they emphasize the prohibitions most of all, that becomes really the focus of what they do or they, t they teach, the prohibitions. Um, and the women teach only children. On the far other end, you know, then you have equality in all ways. You know, all leadership positions are male and female. All power positions are either male or female, whatever. Uh, so that's the very extreme. And then there's the broader middle. And probably most of our churches are more like in the broader middle. Um, best practices does not attract a whole lot of highly clergy-centric churches, um, which is why a lot of us like to be here, I think. Okay. So uh, think about your congregation, your church body. Where does it fall on this Probably mostly in the broad middle. Huh? Okay. 
Now, this leads us towards women's ordination, that is, clergy women in particular. Well, one thing I have noticed is uh, bedfellows, kind of like, think, who practices this, all right? Because it does tell you something, doesn't tell you everything, but most all the church bodies that practice female ordination have given up the Bible, and they've adopted the culture. That's what it boils down to. The United Methodist Church, Episcopalian Church, um, you know, the, which segment of the Presbyterians, I don't remember, but pretty much uh, these denominations don't believe what the Bible says on just about anything. I mean, they, they've come down to love your neighbor, you know, is the theme of the Bible, and they've literally thrown out the miracles of Jesus as having any value, including the resurrection. They'd say these are just fairy tales. You're supposed to be inspired by this story of Jesus healing the lame man, but he didn't actually heal anyone at all. That's what they really are saying. So they use the word story in the sense of myth. So if you see a story of Jesus stopping the storm, it's just a story. It's made up. It's a myth. You know, it's supposed to comfort you, but Jesus maybe didn't even exist, much less tell a storm to stop, and it did. Okay? So they've thrown out so much of the Bible that I don't trust them on this either. I don't trust them on anything uh, because the, the core is gone. They've given up Jesus as the only source of salvation, and they've given up the Bible as the, the word of God authoritative. And so, so to me, this is an argument against women's ordination if those are the churches that do that. Now, there are just a few places in which you have conservative believers that practice women's ordination. One is Salvation Army. You know, they basically have a biblical faith that's more biblical. Um, in mission fields, you tend to see more women's leadership, partly because there is less structure, sometimes rapid growth, and there's more of a demand that way. But pretty much in the established churches, nobody believes the Bible and practices women's ordination. That's a bad sign for it. Um, biblical church bodies, on the whole, don't practice women's ordination. Uh, and that's true of both historic churches and new churches. So Calvary Chapel is a comparatively new denomination, you know, launched in the 70s. Uh, they don't practice women's ordination. So it's not a matter of whether you're an old church body and the culture was against women then, or a new church body, you know, which is pro-women. It's a matter of whether you're biblical or not. That's really probably what it boils down to. Okay, so I want to, I want to lead you towards a, a, a place in which, uh, you know, I, I don't own up to women's ordination uh, because of the strictures against it, and we'll get into that, okay. But uh, I do think that women's ministry is overly, uh, overly restricted. Okay, so I think this is uh, the, where the biblical focus is, and that is in the word oversight. And so pretty much whenever um, what we would call clergy or pastors, you know, are set apart in the book of Acts and in the epistles. They use the word oversight. They, they don't use the word pastor. You don't find the noun pastor in the book of Acts. You do find the word overseer and elder, those two. Okay, so I think we should take this word seriously. So an overseer is kind of roughly compared to being a director of a play or the coach of a team or a principal of a school um, or the chief of some sort. So this is the word that's emphasized in the New Testament. So the Greek word is episcopus, from which we get the word bishop or episcopal. Um, and unfortunately that's made, you know, applied to like the higher level people like the district president to oversee the other pastors. Okay, but in the book of Acts, overseer is what every pastor is called, you know, along with presbyter and, and deacon. And various words are used not a specific one for ordain, but appoint, elect, or choose. So the focus is responsibility. If you're overseeing the church, overseeing ministry, the focus is on responsibility. It's not on authority, and it's not even on, you know, it's on a kind of a kind of ministry, which is oversight, which is basically to supervise or be responsible for, uh, not to do all the ministry. Authority really is used only once in Timothy. And unfortunately, uh, my take is a lot of 
pastors come out of seminary thinking they're authorities, and that just ruins a lot of churches and people, unfortunately. Uh, if you take your position as responsible something, I mean, I'm a pastor. I'm scared of that word. I like responsibility. No, I don't want this. You know, and I know I'm responsible for things. I know I'm in hot water, and God's going to rake me through the coals when I go to Judgment Day. But fortunately, he's also given me a lot of grace. You know, so I, I don't relish this position at all because I take seriously the responsibility or the oversight. So oversight is not the same as teaching. It's not the same as preaching, and it's not the same as leading. Teaching, preaching, leading are all described as being spiritual gifts that are given to the church. Um, so there are certainly women who excel at you know, teaching and leading in various ways, and that's uh, not the same as oversight. So uh, in overseeing, you are overseeing or keeping track of, guarding, watching, correcting the teaching of the church. Uh, the practice of the congregation, uh, the spiritual lives of individuals, and especially of the leadership, overseeing the ministry. Um, so what it kind of says is, you know, if you're elected, appointed as a pastor or overseer, this is where your focus is, not in doing the ministry, but of overseeing ministry that's done. And uh, I believe that opens the doors more to ministry of men and of women, both, in a way that isn't uh, true if you see the ministry as being embodied in the pastor. So I think that is designed to be that way, where uh, we need oversight in the church. I mean, you do need someone who's responsible for what goes on and who corrects things when they're wrong and sets the direction when things are right. You have to have someone that's responsible, right? Just like you need someone in responsibility in a business or someone in responsibility in your family or, you know, pick your venue. You have to have someone who takes responsibility and uh, corrects when that's needed, you know, and sets the right direction. So I think that's where the focus should be. And when the uh, uh, clergy is a bad word, right? It's not a biblical word. But when the clergy are overseeing, that that opens up more opportunities for ministry. So I think bad terms for being a pastor are things like priest or the office of the holy ministry or the holy office or the office of preaching. These are all common terms in the Missouri Synod. And I think they stink. I mean, I hear them all the time and I think they're bad. You can quote me on that. Uh, I'm on tape, <laughs> you know, and, and I remember going to seminary and then the, the guys coming out of seminary, a lot of them, uh, it seemed to me like they kept hearing the office of the Holy Ministry, office of the Holy Ministry, office of the Holy Ministry, and they came out thinking they were holy ministers, I think. If you come out of seminary less humble than you went in, something went wrong, right? Because Jesus keeps pointing us towards humility and responsibility. So these miss the point, you know, and so I think we need to get back to the biblical term, which is oversight. That's the pastor's job, oversight. Your job isn't to be the minister. You do ministry, right? Okay. But your primary central function is oversight, and so ministry is done by uh, both men and women in the church. Okay, so how does this relate to women's ordination in particular? The positions of oversight in the New Testament are always men. I mean, this is what it boils down to. So the 12 apostles are the first overseers, uh, and then they basically ordain, elect uh, those people to replace them. Um, you know, and it filters down, you know, to overseers of particular congregations, of regions, whatever. You know, but the thrust is oversight, not ministry per se. Um, <clears throat> and so the, the deacons are also men, of course, and the elders in Ephesus were men. And Acts, Paul mentions that from the overseers, males were arise with heresy. You know, if this is a mixed group, male and female elders, Said and for only the men would go off track and not the women. Uh, I don't put that much faith in you women any more than I put it in men, so we can all be let off track. 
So those are, you might say, the, de the descriptive verses where it describes people in oversight. And by the way, the word, or the, the adverb, adjective, whatever it is, oversight is used by Peter. He mentions we have to uh, have someone replace Judas in this ministry of oversight. So he uses that word of the apostles. Okay, so that's descriptive verses. There's prescriptive verses, which are qualifications. And so it mentions in what 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, the qualifications of being an overseer. And there's things like, you know, husband of one wife. Well, you can't really have a woman who's a husband of one wife, right? Unless you really twist around the words and make husband something different than it is, which some people do. But certainly, you know, it's not a, a biblical approach to that. So those are prescriptive. And we take qualifications seriously. You know, any position of responsibility, whether that's a teacher of a class or the principal of a school, has qualifications. And so office of overseer has qualifications as well. Uh, Jesus told, tw shows 12 men. Liberals today would probably choose two men, two women, two gays, two lesbians, two transsexuals, three androgynous, which is, of course, 13, because they wouldn't stop at 12. All right, so at any rate, you know, that is significant um, that Jesus did that. It's also interesting that God presents himself to a church using these male-oriented images. You know, he's the bridegroom, the husband, the church is the bride. Uh, that makes me a woman, right, if I'm the bride. Well, of course, this is an image, right? It's not a sexual thing. It uses uh, uh, something we recognize, marriage, you know, a lifelong commitment, you know, between two people, you know, as an image for a relationship between Christ and the church, you know, with promises, commitment, love, responsibility, etc. So it's not saying God is masculine and I'm feminine, you know, or there's the ten virgins, right, or waiting for Jesus, you know, that makes me one of the virgins, a yeah, picture of that, right? So these are just images, but it's interesting that he does pick those images. So he could have flipped it, I guess, and said, you know, God is the uh, wife and the, or Christ is the wife and the church is the husband. Uh, it doesn't quite work, does it? <laughs> no. Yeah, and I think part of this is in response to the the milieu of the first uh, of the first century, in which goddess worship was a big thing. You know, there's as many goddesses in Roman and Semitic uh, religions as there is gods, and uh, God wants to get away from that. You know, he isn't a masculine being, and he has a consort with him. Um, you know, in the family, it does speak of uh, Christ being, or men being head of the family, and so that, that is a kind of oversight position again. Uh, and yeah, we need responsibility within our families as well. Okay, so here is the kind of the watershed question. Uh, why aren't there women in positions of oversight? Is it because women are incapable? I don't think anyone, well, probably some people say that, but I, I don't buy that. I, I do think that female clergy approach ministry a little differently than male clergy, just like women approach situations different than men, right? Okay, but I don't think that amounts to being incapable. You know, did the New Testament say this because society wouldn't accept uh, women pastors and Christian churches, and so they said, well... Uh, you know, we have to bow to the members of our congregation by not having women clergy. Were the male apostles just prejudiced against women? Uh, did God pick this? And he doesn't say how. Okay, so there are arguments for the ordination of women. Mostly they amount to trying to do away with the prescriptive verses, husband of one wife. you got to get rid of that somehow, right? Um, or doing away with the descriptive verses somehow. And I think that's a really hard, high hill to climb. I think you really can't do that. It's just too prevalent in the prescriptive and 
descriptive verses about uh, uh, male overseers. So what's driving that? Part of it is secular society. You know, obviously you do see an emphasis on not just equal between men and women, but women leadership in particular. You know, so this is one driver. Um, and liberal theology, you know, Episcopalians, etc., that definitely that is a driver. Uh, that's what they teach in their seminaries and in their other venues. So that's part of the driver. There's also allies of that. I mean, we do have oppressive male pastors or oppressive male leaders. And so then, you know, you feel like you're overwhelmed and you are, and you are, right? So you want to get out of that uh, stricture, and that's legitimate. And there are also conservative leaders who don't speak up because then you know people in your church will dislike you and they'll leave, or the society will dislike you. You know, and so there's pressure to kind of not say anything, even if you believe uh, that male overseers is the case. And there are women who feel called to ministry. Although, uh, I would say, if you have a clergy-centric view, then being called to ministry being, means being called as a pastor, right? Okay, so I think that the, the point is to not be clergy-centric, you know, to recognize that oversight is an important part of church ministry and that some people qualify and are called to those positions of oversight, but we're talking about one out of 100 people, right, or one out of 150 or something like that. Now, that doesn't mean that the other 149 men and women in your church are inferior to whoever is called to responsibility, because it's not a matter of, you know, you're better, and so that's what qualifies you uh, to be an overseer, but rather the people recognize you as being responsible and being to the extent possible, an example of Christ. I mean, that's really what that means. And that means responsibility as well. It's not strictly speaking authority or ministry. So were the early church and the male apostles prejudiced against women because their culture was? Was the church itself countercultural at that time in the first century? If they want to put you in prison and kill you, then I would say uh, you are not fitting into society, right? <laughs> yeah, so the church was very much opposite culture. Uh, that's why they were persecuted by the Jews and by the Romans. They're countercultural. So, you know, the argument that says, you know, the apostles, you know, gave in to society about women's not being ordained, you know, doesn't ring true they gave their life to the faith, they're not just given in on uh, what's relatively a minor issue, I guess you'd say. Now there is this verse that's sometimes quoted uh, from Galatians 3, all were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, you're one in Christ Jesus. So is this speaking of ministry positions? Well, it's not talking about ministry positions at all. So, you know, to, to use this as an argument for women being ordained, you're really taking it out of its context and then applying it in a different way. So we call that bad exegesis, bad interpretation. Uh, yeah, so you're all one in Christ, and so it is talking about spiritual standing, regardless of your birth, your ethnicity, uh, your status in society, whatever but there are still roles or callings that differ. Okay, so you see these lingos sometimes thrown into discussion of women's ordination. Equality, rights, patriarchal, misogyny, sexism, or the writings in the New Testament is done by the winners, which are males. Okay. I don't think we should ever use these words in the church, partly because none of them are biblical words at all, and they're all inflammatory. You know, I mean, they, all these words are inflammatory, and they do tend to, like, 
paint people with very broad brushes. And so that's one reason why I started this with asking questions, you know, is the church prejudiced against women or women who want to be pastors, feminists, whatever, right? Because there are those inflammatory words and inflammatory words don't get you closer to the truth. You know, they go off track. And so to take secular American concepts like that and use them, you know, just muddles and makes, you know, puts fuel on the fire and doesn't help. It doesn't help. Let's try to stick with biblical um, phrases and words in discussion of this. Now, does can hierarchy and love and oneness coexist? And the answer is yes. And so in 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about the body of Christ being one, right? But it does talk about distinction because there are different members. It actually uses the word weaker for some gifts. It uses ranking. says there are greater and then there are lesser. Well, it doesn't say lesser, but it says greater. You have to say well, greater gifts and lesser gifts. And there is hierarchy. It says first there's apostles, second prophets, third. Uh, okay, so, so you can have all those things that are kind of bad in an American sense. You know, hierarchy, distinction, rank, weak. Um, you can have all those things and still have unity, and you can still have love. You can still have um, uh, ministry uh, done by the body of Christ and still have responsibility or oversight over that. This verse comes up. What about Phoebe? Yeah, not that Phoebe. Uh, but some point to this verse, you know, she's talked about as being a diaconess, diacona. Um, and so in... Let's see, three times in the New Testament that's used of a church office, you might say, the deacons. But then you've got 160 where it's used in the general sense of a servant. And by the way, even if you take deacon as an office, that's not the same as uh, oversight. It's different. Uh, Julia, this is interesting. Julia, well-known to the apostles, well-known among the apostles. You know, people who support women's ordination says it must be among the apostles because we want it to read that way. And uh, that makes her equivalent to Peter, James, and John, etc. Uh, so that preposition is kind of a... Uh, you can translate that preposition different ways in that case. Uh, by the way, apostle, you can also translate in a generic sense. It's used most often of those 12 who are appointed by Christ, but other places it's used in a generic sense of an envoy or messenger. So there are sticky wickets, those odd verses. What do you do with them? Should we fit into the values of society? This is the biggest danger, you know, because we hear so much from our society on the whole, I think the majority of people in our churches think more like society than like the Bible. This is like one of the main problems in the church is we think more like Americans than like Christians. So we've got to battle this all the time. And so any uh, interpretation that leans that way, that says they were culturally influenced, uh, we're showing our cultural influence by wanting to be like Americans. So I don't think that's a good approach, and I want to avoid that as much as possible. I don't think it's uh, being true to the Bible. Also, there's this thought that the New Testament is a human production. So, I mentioned that earlier. You know, uh, the Episcopalians, etc., they don't think God's word is God's word, except in the most vague, general way. You know, like a good poem is God's word or something. So, uh, you know, and so if you end up having your interpretations based on that, that's screwy. And uh, there's some things in the Bible that should, should make us feel uncomfortable, or that do, even if maybe they shouldn't. And that's not necessarily bad. So when a verse is, seems odd, like Timothy about silence, you know, um, you know, it could be it's right, but our thinking is kind of screwed up. Could be some word is used differently in that context than in other contexts. Um, it could be it's supposed to correct a particular situation in a particular church. So, you know, here's where we need to have kind of careful thinking. And it's especially true in this case, but in any part of the Bible, you want to interpret a verse in the light of 
the rest of the book that it's in and the rest of what that author wrote and interpret in the light of the whole New Testament or the whole Bible. Um, and unfortunately, that introduces, introduces a fudge factor that can be really misused or used well, you know, and that's where it becomes uh, uh, more difficult to think through and to discuss with people. But those are particular questions, you know, in what places should a, a man or a woman teach or have authority? How does this relate to, you know, the oversight in the church? You know, these are questions individual churches, I think, need to make especially. I'd say we don't know why God chose Abraham's line as his chosen people. We don't know why he chose Aaron as priests. We don't know why he chose David's line for the Messiah or two families as four of the 12 apostles or men for oversight. I wish I knew these things. But you know what? We would still argue with God even if we knew why he did something. I mean, don't we already do that? Uh, you argue with God. I disagree with him a lot. Okay, so I think uh, my target in dealing with this is to separate ministry from oversight. You know, oversight is important, and God's called men to do that. I don't know why that is, but that also should leave a lot more room for ministry in by both men and women. And I think both men and women are overly restricted in many or most churches. Uh, women more than men, but uh, you know, I think we overseers, pastors, need to get out of the way of ministry more often, uh, both men and women, but, and still maintain responsibility, which is a hard balance to keep, but I think it's an important one. And there's going to be some inconsistencies, so whether you interpret some of those verses in kind of a liberal way or interpret them in kind of a conservative way, you're going to be inconsistent. There's no, there's no way you can be consistent on everything here. So I think we need to kind of own up to that. We're all inconsistent. You can't just you know, accuse somebody else as being inconsistent and you're just fine. You know, that's not true either. The New Testament doesn't tell us everything. So from the standpoint of overseers, I think we need to make more opportunities for people to minister, both men and women. Um, and be less clergy-centric while keeping oversight and uh, encourage a lot of women to jump into ministry and uh, uh, many good things will happen. If they did, we'd be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> we would. Okay, other questions or comments? Thank you for Mm -hmm. Biblically driven, powerful presentation. Very enlightening. You're welcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else? Um, yeah, and so if you didn't pick it up, there's an outline to this presentation back there, and there's a smaller piece on ordaining women, and there is like a DVDs of this show. If you want to take one along, they're free. Okay, well, God bless. Enjoy your donuts. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.